This picture you're about to see is the first cinematic study of the preparation, arrival, and establishment of permanent cover for secret agents. We are fortunate in having with us for this occasion Colonel Robinson, Chief of Schools and Training. Colonel, before we start the picture, perhaps you wouldn't mind saying a few words. All right, Lieutenant. I will make this short because I know that you are all just as anxious to see this movie as I am. I wish that it were possible for me to meet all of you men personally. But since it isn't, I'll take this opportunity to say hello and to tell you that I'm glad you're with us. Many of you are going to desks in this country or to assignments in neutral countries where you may not be faced with the problems portrayed in this film. But if this brings you just a little closer to those men who are going into the hottest spots, I hope that it will help you to do a better job. This picture does not presume to give you all of the answers, of course. I do think, however, that it will provide a foundation on which to do your own building. For after all, no war service provides a greater scope for individual initiative and imagination than this job for which you have volunteered. All right, Lieutenant, take it away. Thank you, Colonel. Okay, Al, let it go. This is an undercover agent. At least the popular conception of how such a fellow looks and behaves. He is inconspicuous. He blends with his environment. He is, in short, the ideal agent from the enemy's point of view. He's just the kind of agent the enemy is waiting for with open arms. And for that reason, just the kind of agent you aren't going to be. Student now? Right. You seem to have made a good impression at the schools. Nice work. Thank you, sir. Pull up a chair. Cigarette? Thanks. I think you were told something about your assignment before you went to E, weren't you, Al? Yes, to obtain intelligence on aviation production and the position of vital targets in the capital district of enemy areas. Correct. You are to set up an intelligence organization which will gather information for an SO operation. Are you set on your cover? Not definitely. I've narrowed it down to two. Either a government inspector or a chief mechanic. Government inspector. Hmm. Better for a native agent than a planted one. And these days, when enemy area is using every available man under 50 in the army, people might wonder what special pull you had. Anything that makes people ask questions, even innocent ones, is bad cover. Then you think the mechanic's the better bet? If you're a good mechanic, you know nothing will blow you quicker than not knowing your job. Well, I put in seven years with General Motors, and with a little brushing up, I think I'd be all right. A mechanic in an airplane plant near the capital. That might be the ticket. We know they need good mechanics so badly now, that it might not take you too long to establish good permanent cover. Now, if I could get a job on the night shift, I'd have plenty of time to devote to my hobby during the day. Good. I like the way you're thinking. Now go to work. The background's familiar to you. You'll be able to get the latest material at the farm. The most recent laws and local restrictions, even the latest slang our intelligence has picked up. Fine. I've already made up a list of things to check off. Good. If there's anything you don't get that you think you need, the door's always open. And by the way, I'll get right to work on those financial details for you. Hope to have that insurance for your family pushed through before you leave. <laughs> 
That's very kind of you. No, it's not kind. It's my job to do everything I can to help you think about nothing but your job. Well, I'll let you know when I'm ready. Right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm student Charles. Loy, eh? Pretty good cover. Thank you. Sit down. I'm going over your evaluations from the schools. Oh, that stuff. I spent enough time on the other side to know my way around. Mm, that's what you told him, Eddie, after they took your pants off at the Thursday night round table. If you set me down in a real spot, it'll be another story. We're considering you for a real spot. We're trying to establish a man in one of enemy area's chief seaports to observe the naval concentration there and to find out whether or not there's a submarine base in that vicinity. Now, you could do it if you went in with the right attitude. Look, if you think I've got the ability, don't worry about my attitude. Which port is it? El Porto. El Porto! My old stamping grounds. I could draw that coast with my eyes closed. Well, this job calls for you going in with your eyes open. Now, you know the locale, all right. But that isn't enough to get by. Now, think it over and come back when you're uh, ready to talk cover. I'm ready now. El Porto, let me see. I've got it. A fishing boat, Skipper. I've raced around there enough to know the channels by heart. Mm, fishing has possibilities. And we have a lot of contacts with fishermen around there, you know, who could probably take care of you. Then it's all set. No, it's just something to consider now. If it doesn't hurt your feelings, we'd like to bust you from skipper to an ordinary seaman. You know, the, every skipper is known to the shore patrol there, but if you are just a member of the crew, like the thousands of in every seaport, well, you might get by with it. Get by with it? I talk the language like a native. I know those waters better than most natives. How can I miss? Very easily. By going on like you've been going, by knowing all the answers before you even think of the questions. Now, we'll give you all the dope you require about this El Porto area, but just don't read it, absorb it. Okay, if you want to waste time. But I tell you, I know El Porto like a book. Perhaps the enemy has added a couple of chapters since you've left. Aye, aye, sir. You're all set on your story, eh? Well, I'd like to try it out on you. All right. Shoot. Let's see how closely it conforms to your own life. And don't forget, I'll be watching for errors as closely as an enemy police officer. Here it is. My name is Albert Horn. Both my parents were born in enemy area and had lived in Detroit for five years when I was born there in 1903. I was in Detroit until 1913, when my mother died. And I was sent back to live with my aunt and uncle in the capital of enemy area. I graduated from the gymnasium in 1920 and went to work in my uncle's bicycle shop. In 1924, I went back to Detroit 
and worked as an apprentice in the Ford plant. In 1926, I transferred to General Motors, where I worked as a machinist until 1931. From 1931, I was on relief until 1936, when I went back to my old job at General Motors. Just before my home country went into the war, I felt it was my duty to return there and serve in any way I could. Arriving here on the U.S. tourist passport, I volunteered with the engineers. And then, after a year and three months in the Army, I'm discharged with a bad back. Ever had a bad back? No, but I thought I could fake it. Never say anything you can't prove. Why not make it sciatica? That's one ailment the best doctor in the world can't prove you haven't got. Okay, sciatica. I convalesce for a short time in the country at a friend's house. That will be the farmhouse you're taken to by the reception committee. And then when I'm directed to find employment in an aircraft factory because of my technical experience, I come to the capital and make arrangements for an interview with the superintendent of the Falcon plant. Sounds all right, Al. That story ought to stand up. It's a little blip, perhaps, but it isn't bad. Now, you talk a good fisherman. Now you've got to learn to be a good fisherman. The next thing in the agenda is a couple of weeks with the commercial fishermen on the Grand Banks. Won't I stink enough of fish on the other side without having to get a two-week start? Well, it isn't a question of stinking like a fisherman, Oh, that's important, too. You've got to know the ropes, literally, I mean. But I'm a fisherman from way back. Why, I landed the biggest sailfish ever caught in Mexican waters back in 33. 189 pounds. You can look it up in the record book. I'd rather read the records in your hands. Let me see your palms. Oh, good, good calluses. Mm. I think a couple of weeks of salt water and hard work will really get you in shape. But I've got to have some relaxation. After all, I'm not going abroad for my health. And it's my neck. <sighs> now, that's where you're wrong. Once you join our team, it isn't a question of your own neck anymore. Those brains of yours are a vital connection point in our system of intelligence. When one fuse is blown, the lights go out all over the house. So, we're just as interested in safeguarding that neck of yours as you are. Whether you're checked before you leave or on the other side, the principle is always the same. The most unimportant detail may be the most important. When you get your hair cut, be sure it's enemy area style. The hands must look as if they've done the work. Every scar must conform with your cover story. Clothes may not necessarily make the agent, but they surely break the agent if they aren't checked and rechecked. That's an enemy area cut, all right, but it's too expensive for a mechanic. Well, that's the type of coat you would wear, but there aren't any left. That's right, the Army got all the heavy coats in the last winter drive. How about that one? I think this raincoat would be better. Every piece of clothing is examined for the right labels, the right laundry marks, the proper amount of wear and tear. Every toilet article examined minutely. How about this razor? Can we use straight razors over there now because of the shortage of blades? Even if your papers have been forged by experts from the most recent enemy area documents, proof them yourselves. Just a minute. This army discharge reads Alfred Horn. Everything else is Albert Horn. Nice eye, Al. Just want to see if you're on the ball. You don't have to worry about the rest of those papers. Even the texture and watermarks have been duplicated. Just as important as your official papers, and more subtle to select, are your casual effects. The odds and ends you happen to have with you that may be more convincing to the enemy area police than your identification and travel permit. The stickers on your suitcase, 
a handful of cigarettes, a train stub, an old address book, a letter addressed to you as a private in the army from a girl in the town you're going to, and a snapshot of her with you in an enemy area uniform. Details, each one a thread woven into the pattern of your cover story. How many cases of blown cover you studied were due to neglect of some insignificant detail of cover that didn't seem worth checking a second time. This is German Agent X. He landed in Canada from a submarine two days ago. So far, he's doing all right for himself. His landlady believes he's a war worker from out west in British Columbia. This afternoon, his forged papers and his convincing line got him a job in an aluminum plant. No wonder he feels like joining in the singing. On the silvery moon, happy is the day when we line up for our pay as we go rolling, rolling home. Say, that's not bad. Come on over and join us, will you? Thanks. Don't mind if I do. I've got four pants, jolly, jolly four pants. I've got four pence to last me all my life. I've got tough pence to spend and tough pence to lend. And no pence to send home to my wife, a poor wife. No cares have. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> That's all I've never been. <laughs> Thanks, but it's, it's getting late. I'd better be going. Oh, don't be a killjoy. We're just beginning to wet our whistles. I'd like to have another drink with you boys, but i got to be on the job at the crack of dawn. Good night, fellas. Oh, we'll see you again. So long. What's the damage? That'll be a dollar eighty, sir. That's easy. Keep the change. Thanks. Come again. Right on. Hey, will you look at this? What do you got there, Peg? One of those old bills the government called in before the war. Gee, I haven't seen one of these big fellas in a long time. Now, where the devil do you suppose he got this? Yes, Agent X was doing all right for himself until he passed an obsolete bill, one-third larger than the present issue. Months of preparation were nullified by insufficient attention to what seemed like an insignificant detail. Carelessness, conspicuousness, blown cover. That's the fatal triple play that put German Agent X out of the game. Agent Y was a smooth operator, a Spanish phalangist who had turned in a good job for the Nazis in Mexico before moving on to Los Angeles to incite Mexican youths against other Americans and recruit the keenest of them into an espionage organization. He has not been in Los Angeles long, but long enough to win friends and influence zoot suitors. Come on, kids. I got paid today. Have another shot. Brother, this tequila is murder. What the hell? The army's getting you next week anyway. What have you got to lose? Just his stomach, that's all. Oye, <laughs> muchacho. <laughs> Andale, another round. Another round? Are you kidding? You know what time it is? A las doce, the bar is closed. Here's a buck for yourself. Maybe that'll help keep the bar open for one more round. Say, so, hey, you're really a killer, aren't you? Killer? What do you mean, calling me a killer? Killer diller, trying to buy me off for a lousy buck when the state commission fines me 500 for selling after hours. Oh, I see. Killer. That's an expression you use, eh? Say, how long you been in L.A.? Oh, I don't know, three, four years. Where'd you live before that, Juanito? Uh, San Bernardino. Come on, let's get What's out of here. What's the nickname for San Bernardino? What is this, a third degree? Since when do customers have to answer questions by stupid waiters? Come on, muchachos. Um. The Everyone who lives there knows the nickname of San Bernardino, brother. San Bernardino. And anybody that never heard of a killer diller. The waiter was anti-phalangist and anti-Nazi. From that moment on, he kept his eyes on Senior Y. 
he began to notice other idiomatic slips. When his suspicions were passed over to the authorities, they were quickly confirmed. And the enemy lost a clever agent, but not quite clever enough to remember that even details of slang are a necessary part of his cover equipment. Uh, what firm uh, did you say uh, you worked for in Copenhagen? Helsing for Dairy Company. And uh, what is your exact position with this company? I'm the assistant foreign branch manager in Germany. British agent Z has made repeated trips to Germany under convincing commercial cover. Even when he was picked up for making a somewhat suspicious call to Copenhagen, his story was unshaken. And the way he was presenting it was even beginning to influence the expert interrogators of the SS. Christian Dairies Incorporated. And what is the address of this company in Copenhagen? Gentlemen, I'd be very glad to answer your questions all day. But I have a good many business details to complete before leaving your city, and I'm quite sure you have many more important things to do. One moment, please. We are not interested in persecuting Danes. Security police is not an organization of persecution. It is an organization that protects you against the enemies of the state. If you are guilty, you will not escape us. If you are who you say you are, you have nothing to fear from us. Then I have your permission to leave? Yes, you may go. Thank you. Pardon me, Captain. You see, hair grease. If my memory is correct, there has been no hair grease on the continent since the end of 1940. This is preposterous. Quiet. Have a sample of this hair grease, analyzed immediately. You will be kept in solitary confinement, pending the report from the laboratory. Come along. So you have not been in England since 1938, eh? Then how do you account for the fact that this hair grease is a British product which has been applied... A first-rate cover story, and an excellent man, destroyed by a few drops of hairdressing, thoughtlessly rubbed into his hair during his last trip to England a few days before. Months of training, final weeks of thorough briefing, and our agents are ready for the second leg of their journey, on to base country. Charles and a heavy bomber under temporary military cover, while Al crosses as a private on a common transport. In a fashionable apartment in a base country capital, Al locates his desk. You seem pretty well prepared on the whole. We'll have a final briefing as soon as you lose your sea legs. Thank you. We picked up some of the latest changes in enemy area regulations that may alter your documentation a little. I wish they'd quit making new regulations every day. I'd sleep better. Well, from their point of view, they think they're being very clever. They keep changing the rules every five minutes. A newcomer can't stay hidden very long, theoretically. But we found that by keeping our eyes open and using our heads, we can beat that game. For instance, don't go into a strange bar and order the first thing that pops into your head. Your favorite poison may be on the verboten list that day. Look around and see what the others are drinking. Then if you're stuck, appear undecided so long that the waiter will suggest something for you. Mm-hmm. Just remember, this is no suicide mission. It's a 24-hour-a-day job with the odds all in your favor. And to make sure of that, I always tell my men to take out life insurance. I think that's been taken care of back in the... No, I mean your own personal life insurance. By leaving open some avenue of escape in case things get too hot for you. Study your means of exfiltration just as carefully as infiltration. I've known men who were expert drivers in first, second, and high. 
but who never knew how to go into reverse. Don't worry. I'm not the hero type. Good. But just uh, how do you go about leaving this uh, avenue of escape? Well, in the first place, have a cover story ready for that emergency exit. As soon as possible, hide a cache of money somewhere. And when you start building your organization, keep contacts whose only function is to help your getaway. In other words, when I buy this ticket to enemy area, you want me to make sure it's a round trip ticket. In another base country, Charles is concentrating on last minute details of his infiltration into enemy area. What's your name? S Sanford. Sanford. It's a good thing I'm just your base country desk, not an enemy area plain clothesman. From now on, your name's Charles Santos. The next time you give your right name, you may find your interrogator just a little less cooperative. Christ, this is a hell of a way. Listen, there's less chance of having your sleep interrupted later on. You get to know your new name better than your old. Oh, it's practically second nature with me now. It's just that Tomorrow I... Tomorrow, you'd better concentrate on nothing but that name. Drink it. Eat it. Walk around with it until you know it well enough to come up with it out of a sound sleep. Okay, okay. Good night, Charles Santos. Now, there are three or four different ways we can send agents into enemy area. They can go overland, either overtly, under good legal cover, or covertly, sneaking across the border with the help of the underground. An agent traveling overtly would have to pass as a national from a neutral country under some sort of commercial cover. When you're crossing a border this way, you should not only act as if you have nothing to hide, you should actually have nothing to hide. Don't bring compromising materials or messages through these controls. They can be sent to you more safely by other methods once you are established in enemy area. If you're crossing the border covertly, as thousands are doing in Europe these days, don't carry a map with you. It's unhealthy. Unless you carry it in your own head. Memorize the principal landmarks and the basic topography of the area you're entering until you can make your own model of the country on the sand table. If a guide is necessary, be sure you check his reliability. Members of the underground are your best bet. Professionals who charge you exorbitant prices are loyal to only one cause, money. And the enemy world may be just as bright as yours. Borders breed double agents who charge you $1,000 to lead you over the border. And being eminently fair, charge the enemy an equal amount to lead them to you. If you're worried about doubling back on yourself, use your ingenuity in fashioning an impromptu chart of your course, camouflaged as harmless doodling. After you've crossed the frontier, don't get overconfident about those border controls. You're in a 24-hour-a-day battle of wits, and the enemy has secret weapons of his own. Keep moving across country by a circuitous route. For the border isn't a black thread across the map. It's a strip at least 15 miles wide, infested with collaborationists, counter-espionage agents, and special police. Human landmines hidden among the native population to blast your cover. And finally, when you reach a town far enough inland, don't enter it from the border side. Circle around it and enter it from the other side, as if you were coming from the interior. But as I understood it, that was going in by plane. Yes. In your case, it will be safer and faster to drop you by parachute. But we like our men to have a good working knowledge of other methods of penetration. How about these plane landings I've heard of? 
Naturally, when we have a field that we can land on safely without being discovered, it's more efficient. We can pick up an outgoing agent at the same time, for instance. But the only place we can land on safely now is guerrilla territory. How low is this plane going to be when I jump? Maybe it would be a good idea for you to sit down with a pilot who's going to fly you in. He'll give you the dope on just how it's going to be. And another thing, we never set a date until we're damn sure we found the right dropping point. Like this one we picked out for you, for instance. It's just about perfect. It's a level grassy space large enough to allow for adverse wind conditions. And it's far enough removed from trees and telegraph wires so that daylight won't find you hanging out there like an ornament on a Christmas tree. It's 15 miles to the nearest anti-aircraft setup, and my buddies will create a little diversion over there to keep their minds off us until we've set you down. There's a river running closely that I can follow practically all the way in, and a couple of little lakes on the other side that make pretty good landmarks to help me spot the place in the moonlight. About a mile away from the dropping point, there's a safe house owned by a peasant working with us. The liaison chief will be there waiting for you. Everything's on schedule. How soon will they be here? 33 minutes. Take the radio out and bury it, Mary. The container being dropped with Al is bulky evidence of Al's arrival, unless it can be buried deep enough and fast enough. For empty containers, bear it instantly. Tell no tales. We're on time. Let's go. Any broken bones? No, I think I made it all one piece. Our friend's farm is up the hill there, just about a mile. Uh, I'll show you the way. What about my uh, gear? Don't worry, the boys will take care of it. Fine, let's go. While Al enjoys a much needed rest, Charles employs another method of infiltration in reaching enemy area coast. A neutral fishing schooner and itinerant fisherman both familiar sights to this waterfront town provide the most natural sort of cover for Charles' arrival. Can you pick him out? No? I'm afraid the enemy area shore patrol could. It's that stroke of yours, Charles. Look around at the other. Short, jerky strokes. Not the most graceful in the world, but better adapted to choppy surfs and heavy boats. Now look at yours. Long, sweeping strokes. Where do you think you are, Charlie? Back in the dear old Harvard shell? Yes, just a detail. But the kind of detail the enemy shore patrol is watching for. Wait a minute there, Charles. How about that knot? 
Don't tell me you've forgotten the fishermen here have their own particular method of tying up a boat. Keep your eyes open and your mind open, Charles. Otherwise, you're liable to tie that knot around your own neck. As soon as curfew is lifted, Al hits the road to the nearest railway terminal. Ask him where he's coming from, and he'd say, from the farm where I was convalescing after I was evacuated from the bomb city of Coburg. And where was he going? To enemy town to visit my fiance and try to get a part-time job until I'm strong enough to get into a war plan. Oh boy, maybe I can get a hitch to the station. Wait a minute, Al. What did they tell you about cars in enemy area? Nine out of 10, they're state officials. Just the boys who might ask embarrassing questions. Better hoof it, brother. It's better to find a hole in your shoe than a hole in your cover. That's right, whistle. Be as natural as you can. For just a second, what's that you're whistling? Wait till the sun shines, Nellie? That's better. A Viennese waltz. They weren't kidding when they told you at the schools that this was a 24-hour-a-day job. Even what you whistle has to conform to cover. So far, so good, Al. You're not taking the bus because the police are watching the buses pretty carefully these days. Instead, as soon as enemy area restrictions allow daylight travel, you've located the first rural station in the opposite direction from the dropping point. Travel permits. Let's see your travel permit. That's it, Al. Sit back and take this snap control in stride. You've left all compromising material behind to be sent to you later at a previously arranged address. And you know your temporary cover story for this trip holds water because you tested it for leaks at the farmhouse last night. What's your name? Albert Horn. Where are you coming from? The farm near Foberg. A farm, huh? You don't look like a farmer. I'm not. I was evacuated after being bombed out of a hospital in Foberg. Oh. Where are you headed? Enemy town. Sorry to ask you so many questions, but an unidentified plane flew over the neighborhood last night and we can't take any chances. Why are you going to enemy town? I can show you. Hmm, not bad. My fiance. I wouldn't mind going to enemy town for that myself. Oh, it's my patriotic duty. Patriotic duty, huh? Eh? I wish all our patriotic duties could be so pleasant. In enemy town, halfway between the dropping point and the capital, Al heads for the address he was given by the liaison chief. Mr. Durant? Yes? Someone told me you were looking for an assistant. An assistant? I could use an assistant. How much experience have you had? I was a mechanic in the Army, two years in the tank corps. Good. I've been looking for a man with your kind of training. Then I'm your man. Got your work clothes with you? Right here in my bag. Good. Come on inside and I'll start you right to work. Thank you, sir. O 
Over the noise of the machines, Duran gives Al the necessary instructions for the last leg of his journey to the capital. No, not like that. You're throwing away too much. Nowadays, they take four-fifths of our catch. So we use this for chowder. The foreman sees you throwing this away and he wonder where you were when he warned you about it four weeks ago. Oh, I'll just tell him I was out of town that day for my old lady's funeral. I can see you're a very brave man. If you don't mind my saying so, you're too spirited. Look at these fellas around you. They are half dead with hunger and sadness. You must work twice as hard for half as much. Sons are taken away from them, and their children die. Their will to live is very weak. Only men like us are not broken yet, but they must appear beaten too, so as not to stand out from the others. Remember the agent's first commandment, Charles. Don't be conspicuous. Good cover doesn't come automatically with the right clothes. You must put on a new attitude, a new disposition, to fit those foul-smelling baggy pants and the old boots. The best cover story in the world won't protect you if you cannot live that cover. Now that Al has stayed with his friend in enemy town long enough to build up his recent past, He's ready to establish himself in the capital of the enemy area. Remember what we told you, Al. That's why informers like them, too. That's why the desk clerks, the maids, the waiters, and the bellboys are all on the payroll of the secret police. And how about conformity to cover? What's a mechanic doing at the best hotel? is a good idea, if you know the family. If they're overly suspicious, it's too easy for them to keep tabs on you. And if they're overly friendly, they might restrict your movements too much. No, better keep on going, Al. But keep it in mind when you're ready for permanent quarters. To get that talkative landlady, Al, she'll be watching you like a hawk. No matter how discreet you are, she'll find something to talk about. The very idea. I gave him a piece of my mind, I did. Strange city. 
Sorry to spoil your fun, Al. But remember, every prostitute's an informer, or a potential informer. And that's a good reason for staying out of brothels, too. Plus the fact that Lamour is constantly being interrupted by snap controls. How about this? Might be something to tide me over. A migratory clientele. Sailors coming and going at all hours. Would give me lots of freedom a moment. But the merchant marines are breeding ground of political resistance, attracting agent provocateurs and snap controls. And again, conformity to cover. Would a respectable craftsman pick a dive like this? A medium-sized hotel. Not important enough to be headquarters for a secret police. Not so small that I'll be watched too closely. And just about the right size for my economic status. This may do the trick. You can't find perfect security anywhere in town, Al. But this is probably your safest bet for the first few days. So you might as well go in and get some shut-eye. Meanwhile, we'll take a swing over to the coast and see how our old friend Charles is getting along. Charles was supposed to spend two or three weeks in the fishing village where he landed, building up his recent past, before working his way up the coast toward El Porto. But two or three weeks to the average agent is just two or three days to Charles. After all, he's a fast worker. How about letting me walk you home after work? Some other time, maybe. When my boyfriend gets hit out again. He's over there now. In the corner. He gets sort of jealous sometimes. <laughs> Submarine, eh? Well, what does he look like? This is kind of a hangout for them, isn't it? You better drink your beer. All right, all right. Any idea how soon you'll be shipping out again? Say, for a fisherman, you ask an awful lot of questions. Tell the truth now. You wouldn't like me to sit around here like a clam. No, I guess not. I get kind of tired looking at these fishermen hanging around here like a lot of sour apples. But you, you're sort of different. Oh, I better get back to my sailor now. He's got his eye on me. That's all right. You keep the change. Say, what do you catch out there? Goldfish? Here you are, Rudy. Another beer. No, it's all right. It's paid for. Out of that tip that fisherman left me. Tip, eh? What's a fisherman doing throwing his money around? Probably another one of those black market bugs. Oh, I don't know. He seemed honest enough. He really is an interesting fellow. Interesting? You must have drunk too much of your own beer. Why, all these stupid fishermen are the same. Not this one. He seems a lot smarter than the others. Well, he better not get smart with you. Boy meets girl. If this were a Hollywood movie, that would be the beginning. But here in enemy area, it's much more likely to be the end. What's the matter, Al? Have a bad night? Getting jittery? Don't let it get you down. Sooner or later, it happens to the best of them. You can handle it. Why don't you start doing something about it? Nobody around here stays in his room all day, unless he's sick or scared. A 
looks okay. Guess I'll go out and have a look around. Go ahead, answer it. It's probably nothing but the maid. Keep her waiting, and you start talking. Come in. Good morning, sir. May I clean your room now? Oh, why, sure. I was just getting ready to go out. Well, it was a little better last night, wasn't it, sir? But I hear they knocked out a ball bearing factory on the outskirts. Well, that's a shame. Yes, the way things are going, they'll need every man in the country now. Do you work here in town, sir? Well, I got a job at the Falcon plant. The Falcon plant? Oh, well, that's where my cousin works. What department are you in? I mean, I've got an uh, appointment for a job at the Falcon plant. Oh, good for you. I hear they're taking on a lot of men these days. See, it's uh, quite a bus ride out there. I better be going. Well, good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Remember what we told you. If something frightens you, don't run away from it. Turn and meet it. Easy does it now. Pardon me, officer. Do you have the right time? 10.35. Thank you very much. You know you shouldn't throw things in the street? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I guess I forgot. Forgot? With signs all over town warning you against it? Let me see your identification card. Pick it up. In future, observe the regulations. Yes, sir. make sensational disclosures. The goddamned idiot, what the hell's he trying to do? Show off? El Porter is a pretty vital spot. He ought to have his brains examined. If he has any left after the enemy secret police get through with him.
Let's see. Weren't you the fellow who didn't have to study up because he knew this spot by heart? Look at you, soaking wet, out of breath, in danger of your life. If you were a good agent, instead of just a daring one, you'd be home in bed like any other respectable member of enemy area society. Well, your papers seem to be in order. Like any other respectable member of enemy area society, Al gets a war production job. Report to the East Gate on the night shift. Thank you, sir. Moves in with a private family. Makes friends with his fellow workers. Attends the government labor rally. Listens faithfully to all official broadcasts. Receives praise from the foreman as a conscientious workman. Takes a stroll through the park on his way to his job on the night shift. Like any other respectable member of enemy area society. Mind if I look at your paper? Help yourself. Thanks. Say, I see we shot down 12 more of their bombers last night. Yeah, the situation seems to be improving. I hope so. These last few weeks have been pretty tough. Yeah. Want to take a look at the sport page? Thanks. Say, the champion's going to try to make a comeback after all. I thought he was all finished after they shot him down on the Eastern Front. Just a couple of enemy area citizens having a harmless conversation on a park bench. At least that's the way it looks to passers-by. But this casual conversation covers the first meeting between our agent and the cutout who will carry his first message to the WT man to be radioed from enemy area. Well, that's it. It may not make super agents out of any of you, but we thought it might stimulate some interesting discussion. Its main value, it seems to me, is in orienting you toward the type of work you will be doing. As Colonel Robinson has told you, it is not an attempt to teach specific techniques, but merely to present in a little more realistic form the basic concepts and general principles which apply to all undercover and semi-cover activities even in neutral countries or in the Far East where specific techniques would differ greatly from those portrayed here. Of course very few of you will ever be given missions like the ones Al and Charlie had to tackle. Most of you will be recruiting, training or handling agents or performing those routine service jobs for OSS that seem to have so little connection with our agents in enemy occupied territory. But every single job from Camp Cook to Jumpmaster is a part of the lifeline connecting the agent in the field with his home office. No matter how removed your job may seem, the degree of your conscientiousness in maintaining security can be the difference between success or failure in the field thousands of miles away. And if this picture has shortened the distance between you and the man at the end of the line, it is serving a valuable purpose. But regardless of where you fit into the picture, this film, despite its entertainment value, is really a textbook in disguise. And the value of any textbook is your ability to digest the material to where it is something not merely memorized, but actually transfused into your own thought processes. 
An analytic discussion of this picture will undoubtedly crystallize and develop many points that had to be skimmed over in a film as general as this. The first question that came to my mind, for instance, was whether the desk man was right in sending Charles to El Porto in the first place. He'd probably justify his decision by maintaining that Charlie's thorough knowledge of the area and his subjective motivation for the job outweighed his personal shortcomings. Or you might, in running this picture again, test yourself for observation of deals. Did you notice, for instance, in the scene where Al was sweating it out in the hotel room that first morning in the Capitol, that he rubbed out in the ashtray a cigarette that had only been half smoked? Well, in a country where cigarettes have become a scarce and precious commodity, wouldn't this wastefulness make him conspicuous? Well, that gives you an idea of some of the things that you and your other instructors can kick around. And each time you see this picture, I think you will find it more instructive and more provocative. All right, now you've got the floor.